So I'm in the here to Steve. I'm at the School of Social Work here, and I want to uh, welcome you here to the presentation. I just want to do a real quick um, introduction uh, of, of this. It's a speaker series that's um, on evidence-based practice interventions and trying to help uh, folks who are going to be working directly with clients, either doing interventions or maybe doing referrals uh, around evidence-based interventions to get more information about what's out there, what's good for whom, or, um, what referral would be appropriate for whom in what situations. Today we have um, Dr. Kevin King coming to talk about motivation interview. And it's great to see you great turn out here. Um, this speaker series is uh, it's a monthly series on Thursdays. And uh, it's a, it's a, a co-sponsored event uh, by the School of Social Work and also the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy. So it's an interdisciplinary effort that we've been um, working on for the past couple of years. And we're really glad to have the speaker uh, here today. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about Dr. Kevin King who's an assistant professor uh, in uh, clinical psychology here at UW. Uh, he's a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network with expertise in the treatment of adolescents uh, and children. And his research interests center on the etiology of substance use during adolescence, specifically looking at how some individual differences, like the degree of impulsiveness, uh, might interact with uh, in environmental context um, and your personal factors to increase the risk of cross-development. He's been co-investigator on a number of federal uh, research grants, also looking at substance use in youth. And is the author of a lot of peer-reviewed publications in a lot of journals, a couple of them, uh, Journal of Abnormal Psychology and Addictions, Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, um, Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, and Prevention Science. Without further ado, I'm going to be Thank you. Uh, all right, so let's talk about how to motivate people without having to be obnoxious to your audience. <laughs> so, so I'm Kevin, uh, I'm going to talk about MI, uh, you'll hear me, so motivational interviewing abbreviated to MI because really, motivational interviewing is kind of a mouthful. Um, and I, I'm going to try in the next 40 minutes, if I can keep it to 40 minutes, try to keep it to 40 minutes, I'm going to try to um, give you some of the research background for motivational interviewing, some sense about what it feels like and uh, sort of how it works. And then I, I'd like to try to send you away with just a little bit of a taste about what are the things that go into good MI practice. Um, and hopefully you'll hear a lot of my cautions about how hard it actually is to appropriately learn and do MI. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the research about how bad we are at teaching people. <laughs> um, which is a good thing. So like I said, I'm going to try to give you some sense about whether MI works. Um, and I'll sort of talk about for whom. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but there hasn't been a lot of findings yet that it doesn't work for specific populations. But I think we could try to engage in a good discussion about, if we're talking about children and adolescents, sort of what problems might be appropriate, what age might be too young to directly engage in MI with children. Um, I'll try to give you a little bit of theoretical underpinning about how it works, and then also give you a lot of flavor about what the motivational interviewing is like. So let's, let's start with an exercise about what is actually most effective in producing behavior change. So I want you to actually close your eyes for a minute um, and uh, hold up your right hand. I love, I love giving talks because I can make people do things and don't have anything to do anything other. Keep your eyes closed. You can put your hand down. Um, that was just a joke. You, but I do want you here's what it is. So keep your eyes closed and think about something you're thinking about changing in your life. It could be something you think you should change, you feel like you need to change. Um, it, it's something, it, it could be something that, you know, you kind of maybe want to change, but probably you really don't, but you, you know, think about something like that. Okay, now open your eyes, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer who would be willing to share an appropriate thing that they're thinking about changing, but haven't changed yet. So, it, it's not thinking about changing it for like, well, I was thinking about, you know, starting to exercise more, and I'm going to the gym three times a week. That's different. So, is any, I'd like one volunteer be brave and willing to share. Yeah, so could you stand up and come to the front of the room, please? Yeah, she's actually been working on her public speaking, so this is some exposure therapy for her. What's your name? Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Nice to meet you. I'm Kevin. Hi. All right, so would you be willing to share with the group what you think about changing? Sleep. I need more sleep. Okay, so you need more sleep, and you're not getting enough sleep right now. Right. Okay, I'm going to send you out of the room for about three minutes, okay? And we are going to talk about you in very nice ways. Um, so her problem is sleep. Do you want to give us just a little bit of detail about sleep? What, what exactly are you looking to change about sleep? Like well, what's not working now, or what, what are you doing now that you would like to change? Um, I have a 17 month old son, and I, he wakes up a lot okay. in the same room. 
Out okay, so so it's really actually about abandoning your child <laughs> <laughs> and the impact of sleep, right? So you're still waking up a lot. This is why he's still in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. So so it's so you would like to get more sleep, and you want to figure out because your son keeps waking up, and yes. so okay. All right, excellent. So if you could step out three minutes, um, I think we're going to be able to help you here. So so everybody got a sense about what she's looking to change, right? The situation's not getting enough sleep. The sun's in the room keeps waking up and there's got to be some solution. All right, I'm going to brainstorm. So what are the different things, I don't think I have a whiteboard, yeah. but that's okay. We can, somebody just remember. So what are the things she can do to change this? What are some solutions? Just call them out. Earplugs. Okay, earplugs. What else? Hire a nanny. Hire a nanny. What else could she do? Okay, move the baby out of the room. What else could she do? Take naps. Okay, take naps, like in the middle of the day or something. Right. What else could she do? Ah, so she can practice acceptance and maybe commit to that. Um, what else? <laughs> Someday. Right, so she can practice patience. What else can we think of? Take yeah. sleeping pills. Oh, take sleeping pills. Great, drugs are always a great solution. <laughs> uh, get her partner to do a workout system. Ah, yeah, it's like tell her partner, partner to pick up some slack. Um, what else? You know, one more solution. Maybe make it up. Pardon me? Go to bed earlier. Go to bed earlier, right. Okay, so cool. So we got eight solutions with something like 50 people here. Great. Okay, let's take it back in and see how we're doing. Okay, so let's go over what we've come up with for Rachel. And Rachel, I'm just, what I want to try is, so we, the group has brainstormed solutions for you. And so I want you to, I want to I'm going to propose the solutions for you, and hopefully people will help me remember what you all said. Um, it's sort of like in one ear. Um, we have eight solutions for you, and I want us to sort of hear your responses to these different solutions, okay? okay. So the first one was to drug yourself. Try sleeping pills. Have you thought about sleeping pills? Yeah, but no. Why? Why not? Have you thought about it, but? I fantasize about it, but no. <laughs> okay, I don't do drugs. Okay, you don't do drugs. Um, okay, um, right, she, and so probably no drugs for your son either. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys didn't think of that, but. Um, all right, so uh, what about just moving your baby out of the room? Well, we're in a one-bedroom apartment right now, so that's Okay, it. so like the balcony is kind of cold, it's kind of true. <laughs> right, okay. Um, uh, we have bought a couch with a sleeper, and so my husband and I are entertaining the idea of moving to the living room. Okay, wow, so you guys can move. Okay, and you, well, your husband, that was one of the ideas, get your husband to pick up more slack. He does. He does already, okay, so you're already trying that, and still. He's uh, teething, I don't know if anyone near his kids, so you know, he's wakes up a lot of teeth. Right. I'm sure we could come up with more than eight solutions for teething, too, right? <laughs> um, what were some of the other, uh, go to, uh, take a nap in the middle of the day. Nap? I don't, how do you do that in grad school, take naps? <laughs> what are classes for? Um, <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a good one. Okay. But I get all my homework done once he goes to sleep. Oh, uh, okay. So, so you have to sort of wait until he goes to sleep so you can actually do it. But what were some of the Earplugs. other ones that came up with? Earplugs. Ear, oh, earplugs. Oh, earplugs. I, I wear them. <laughs> wow. Okay, I think that's acceptance. that's close to all of them. Acceptance. acceptance. Oh, acceptance. Yeah. How about you just? Um, I, mean, I want to say suck it up. How about you just? Um, how about you just like practice mindful acceptance? <laughs> I will try that. Yeah. I, we, you can actually practice right now. You can practice being mindful on yelling your ear. <laughs> See how that goes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. We have a round of applause. I want to. Um, uh, I have some. That's what we. That's what we just did. Um, so I, we have 50 or more people in this room. I have many PhDs, many doctoral students. I noticed at least a few of my undergrads here. Um, we have people from. I mean, this is a transdisciplinary room, uh, and some of at least some of you here are experts in child development, and you can't come up with more than eight solutions that are actually going to help Rachel and. She, and you're also not going to come up with solutions that she hasn't tried. Doesn't work, right? So this is a this is a group exercise about what happens in many healthcare and mental health care settings. Patients come to us with a problem. We say, "Oh, I got the perfect solution for you," and then they these incalcitrant people sit and argue with us <laughs> about why our solutions aren't going to work. What is wrong with these patients? Okay, so. Um, you can vote if you want. I think you're already sort of getting a sense of what the right answer is here. But if you want, raise your hand 
um, about what is most effective in producing behavior change. Is it giving someone reasons to change? Is it listening to someone's thoughts about changing? Is it teaching someone ways to change? Is it providing some consequence for not changing? Raise your hand for one. Raise your hands for two. Raise your hands for three. Uh, raise your hands for four. No intervention. Interventionists. In the room. Um, okay. So, what I, one of the things I want to point out is that usually our, our sort of natural human instinct is to pick one, two, three, or four. When in fact, most of the literature that the motivational interviewing is derived from suggests that we need to actually turn our instincts on our head, on, on its head, unless you're doing yoga, then you can. Your head. Um, and actually listen to them when someone's thoughts about you. Um, indeed, the research bears this out. So I, this might be a little bit fuzzy, but this is a review called Mesa Grande Review uh, 2002, so there's a lot of updates to it now, showing, this, uh, and this table is beautiful, it gives a rank order of things that work to help people change uh, their addictions, specific to alcoholism. Um, I want to point out, so first, brief intervention and motivational enhancement, largest effect sizes, um, lots and lots of different studies, and there's way more studies now um, up there. The top four, brief interventions, motivation-based interventions, and I also want to point out our friend drugs are also up there. Um, surprising, right? But there are actually a lot of effective drugs to treat addiction. That's a separate lecture. Um, what's down here? Stuff that we normally do. Um, so this one, if you can't read it, confrontational counseling, uh, psychotherapy, so generalized treatment as usual, General alcoholism counseling. So confrontation, confronting people is better than alcoholism counseling. And down here are our bog standards, educational lectures, films, and groups. Teaching about people, teaching people about why their behavior is a problem, why they need to change, it just, it just doesn't work. Well, why is that? Some of the research suggests that there's some dynamic that happens between a health care provider, a mental health care provider, a physical health care provider, um, and their patients or clients that actually influences how the clients respond in session. And I'll show you, um, or at least I'll talk about some data later on that suggests that those in-session responses are strongly predictive of behavior. Okay, so this is a, a really cool study that Jerry Patterson did at the University of Oregon. And what he, uh, what he was interested in was how therapist behaviors related to the kinds of things that the client said. And he was specifically interested in trying to figure out well, what are the things about the ther that the therapist might say that might be related to the patients uh, providing non-compliant responses, resisting, arguing, uh, ignoring, dismissing, all the things that we actually just saw Rachel do so fantastically when we provided her with our expert consensus on how to solve her problem. And uh, one of the things that they found in the correlational aspect of the research was then when uh, providers gave responses that were more like listening and uh, understanding, sort of non-judgmental stuff, uh, the non-compliant responses were really low. And whenever they were given responses that were something like teaching, confronting, or judging, got super high non-compliance. And what they decided to do was, okay, let's actually test this, test this experimentally. So they did an ABAB design where they had therapists avoid all teach-confront responses for a certain period of time with the same client in a session, uh, something like five minutes or so. So this is our baseline. And then they had them go into teach-confront mode, and then they had them go back to baseline, and then back to teach-confront mode. And you see what happens to non-compliant responses, and this is permanent. So how, how often were you getting non-compliant responses from patients? When you're not avoiding teach confront, this isn't even being supportive or empathetic. This is just not being pushy. <laughs> when you when you're pushy, it doubles, and when you go when it goes away, it almost goes back to baseline, and again it almost doubles again when you're back to teach confront mode. So it points to some sort of dynamic interaction between healthcare providers and their patients or clients um, that is producing some kind of this resistance. And it actually, it led to Bill Miller's conceptualization of quote-unquote resistance as not a character inherent to the person, which is sort of the psychodynamic Freudian idea that somebody doesn't change their addiction because they're in denial, they have resistance about it. They, what, what Bill Miller, and I think what this research supports, um, conceptualizes uh, quote resistance as a product of an interaction between a uh, provider and their clients. 